I met here uh, because she was tasked with changing the financial and banking documents from Emmett's name to my name. Uh, so we got acquainted uh, right away. Um, and what I've learned from Jerry and Deb and others uh, is the commitment to excellence that she brings to her work. Um, she has, in a word, been an excellent steward of public funds. Um, she has, under her watch, um, helped the agency establish and maintain a stable financial footing, uh, a AAA bond rating, uh, a nearly a, an uninterrupted string of clean audits uh, going back years, um, and really served as a mentor and a coach for her team. Um, my own view is, you know, part of the importance uh, in public service is being able to show stewardship of public funds and transparency and accountability. And Lori has absolutely modeled those values and helped CT establish itself as a strong and responsive partner here in the in the in the region. So uh, it's my honor to recognize Lori uh, for her 25 years of service to the agency. Um, and I can't wait to work with you more and learn more about the agency. And I wanted to turn it over to Jerry for a couple of minutes to, to share a few words as as Lori's uh, direct supervisor. So Jerry. Thank you, Rick. Um, Lori, congratulations. Wish we were in person in the boardroom doing this. Um, we'll celebrate later. Um, wouldn't be an award for the controller and for Lori Fox without a lot of numbers. Uh, so, and there won't be a test afterwards, but Rick mentioned we have had 25 consecutive clean audits uh, and Lori has been here 25 years. So, you know, that's one of those things that keeps her up at night, making sure we maintain those clean audits and you know how much goes behind the scenes to do that. Um, so that's a one of those honors that we are really proud of. And Lori has a huge, huge role in making sure that that happens through conversations and actions all year long. Uh, 31 consecutive um, certificates of achievement for financial reporting. Um, so the side that board members and the public see is much more on the budgeting and public reporting financial reporting, our, um, our annual report. In 2017, um, we received the very first transit agency award for the state auditor stewardship award. I'm gonna read just a piece from that um, award. This award is presented in recognition of outstanding accomplishment in the stewardship of public resources as we pursue the shared goal of government that works better, costs less, and earns greater public trust. And Lori, really, you know, your leadership with your team and across the agency um, really is a big part of us receiving that award. In turn from external to some uh, internal recognition and board recognition, uh, Council Member Marine in 2013, I don't know if you remember this, but you were on the board and you awarded the board chair award to Lori Fox uh, for her excellence in service to the agency. Uh, Lori has received the Employee of the Year Award at least twice since she's been here at this agency. Um, and just for fun, uh, Lori and I were comparing back to 1996. So how has the agency changed in 25 years? And mm -hmm. no wonder we're all kind of tired. We've done a lot. Um, the population in our PTBA has grown. It was 360,000. Now it's almost 600,000. Budgets uh, grown quite a bit more than that. Our um, operating expense was 41, 42 million 25 years ago, now 170 million. Um, and the sales tax revenue alone, which you know is a big part of our revenue, 22 million 25 years ago, and now 155 million. So pretty amazing uh, changes. And Lori has stewarded us through all of that. Um, Really, Lori, thank you so much for your dedication, um, your attention to detail, camaraderie. We all really uh, have so much enjoyed working with you and are, are proud to work with you. So thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you, I really enjoy working here. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Lori loves all this attention, by the way. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That concludes uh, our recognition for today. Excellent, thank you. Great work, Lori. It's been uh, great working with you all these years. Um, and I guess we'll go back to you then uh, with the Chief Executive Officer's Report, uh, CEO. 
Great. Well, thank you. Uh, and, and good afternoon again, uh, members of the board. So I'm just coming to the end of my fourth week here at Community Transit. And uh, it's been a, a great month so far. The days are literally flying by um, because of all the things that we're doing and I'm seeing and getting an opportunity to learn about. Um, I'll share some of that uh, in a minute, but first, uh, as with our tradition the past year, I want to start with a COVID update uh, on how we're doing and what some of the issues are that we're, that we're managing out there in the field. Um, so day two on the job, uh, four weeks ago, I started with a, a detailed briefing on our COVID response, response uh, with our executive team and our safety and security and emergency management personnel. Uh, and it was really impressive right out of the chute to see how on top of the pandemic uh, our team has been uh, and, and the measures that have been taken uh, to keep our employees safe and our customers safe. Um, so we obviously have, have been able to weather this so far, knock on wood, uh, and have had a great team uh, really organizing the, the organization's response. Um, in terms of cases, uh, we did see six uh, positive cases in January. Um, none of those were work-related and all of those employees have since returned to work. Uh, we've seen one case uh, this week in February. So we have one employee uh, at present who's out. Um, on the operational side, I think you're all familiar with the trend in ridership. Uh, we've seen a, a slight uptick in the past couple of weeks, about 1.7% versus our previous low measured against last year. Uh, but overall, we're still down um, about 58% uh, from 2019 levels. Uh, it won't surprise you to continue to hear that our commuter service has been the hardest hit, uh, down about 88%. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we have seen fairly stable and consistent ridership within the SWIFT system. Uh, so that sort of counterbalances that drop in commuter patronage. Uh, we've just completed work on our annual ridership report for 2020, and the staff will be bringing that information soon uh, into the Strategic Alignment and Capital Development Committee. Uh, in terms of social distancing and, and masks, uh, public health uh, measures for controlling the spread. Uh, we've continued to, we've stabilized at about 85% of our pre-pandemic service levels, and that's been enough capacity uh, to maintain social distancing on board our vehicles. So we've only seen 0.2% of our total trips uh, where we exceeded uh, capacity. Uh, so we're doing about 99.8% uh, compliance with social distancing on board. Um, there's some new developments uh, in terms of masks. You may have read uh, last week and the beginning of this week that the Centers for Disease Control in Washington, D.C. issued an order, a binding order, <clears throat> requiring the public to wear masks when using all modes of transportation, including public transportation. So I want to let you know how that's affecting us and what we're doing about it. Um, first and foremost, we are in full compliance with that federal order. Uh, as you know, masks were already mandatory on our services, and we have seen very good mask compliance system-wide. It's been about 99%. Uh, we've seen a little bit, of, uh, a little bit lower um, in, in spots, uh, particularly with swift blue, but, but still well above 90% there. So we are continuing to supply masks on board each coach. Um, and our operators uh, have been using a script to educate uh, riders about the requirement to wear masks. Um, we have been messaging that since April uh, of last year. Uh, we are updating that messaging to further clarify that not wearing a mask is a violation of a federal uh, order. So we've added that additional emphasis in our messaging and our signage. Um, we have put in place a progressive uh, enforcement um, regime for instances of non-compliance. If we have refusal to comply, uh, operators will be able to call in a supervisor to assist uh, and to address the passenger, and the supervisor will have uh, 
discretion to uh, summon uh, transit security if needed. Um, so we're monitoring this very closely, uh, as you might imagine. And so far, it's been quite quiet out there in the field. We're seeing, we're continuing to see very high compliance. Um, and as of today, having implemented this for, for three days now, uh, so far so good. So we'll continue to keep an eye on this and, and keep you posted. Uh, we're also coordinating on the implementation of this order with our regional partners. Uh, we had a call this week, um, actually several calls. Uh, the regional mobility partnership uh, discussed this, our fellow transit agencies. Uh, we had a WISTA call uh, where we talked about this and uh, FTA uh, hosted a call uh, with regional transit stakeholders um, to talk through how, how to go about this. And, as of now, I'm confident that we're in compliance with, with the order and in alignment with how the TSA is enforcing the order uh, within other modes. On the financial side, uh, a little bit brighter news, you have the December sales tax report in your board packet. Uh, and we just got in uh, yesterday, our, our January report. Uh, some promising news there is that our sales tax revenues remain strong, uh, outperforming our budget uh, for uh, what we assumed would be the case. Um, we assumed, as you'll recall from the budget process, a slow recovery scenario. Um, and it's looking initially now like uh, sales tax receipts will, will outperform our assumptions uh, fairly robustly. Uh, the Finance Committee is going to review the detailed sales tax report at its next meeting, uh, and staff is going to continue to watch this very closely. Uh, but if the trend is a trend, uh, what we've seen the last couple of months, um, it's possible that we could adjust uh, the sales tax revenue budget later in the year. Uh, on the other side of the coin, fair revenue remains low, uh, commensurate with reduced ridership. Uh, we did uh, make a decision uh, last week to extend premium pay for employees. Uh, it was scheduled to uh, lapse uh, this week and have extended it another month through March 6th. Um, we don't see um, uh, or expect that uh, the availability of vaccines is gonna catch up uh, with the population at least for a few more months. And so it made sense uh, to extend premium pay while our essential workers continue to um, show up every day and, and, and work actively in the field. And just by way of reminder, uh, premium pay is a 10% increase for employees who are required to be on site or in the field. So that's our coach operators, our maintenance personnel, supervisors, and related management staff. Uh, we are working with FTA now and the PSRC, and you may have heard in your own jurisdictions, there's going to be another round of federal stimulus funding under the recently enacted Consolidated Appropriations Act. And we don't know exactly what the distribution is gonna be there, but we will keep you posted. We expect it will look a lot like what we just saw in the first round uh, with the CARES Act funding. And of course that funding is available uh, to support uh, service and service related costs uh, during the pandemic. So going forward, we're shifting our focus. Uh, we're not shifting our focus. We're maintaining our focus on vigilance in terms of public health compliance. So we're adding to our focus um, uh, the vaccination process and looking at what we can do to help our employees through that. Uh, we are providing information broadly to our employees about the availability of vaccinations, about the uh, eligibility for vaccinations. Right now, under the current approved categories, uh, 42 of our employees are, are qualified to get the vaccination. So we are encouraging people to do that uh, and to let us know uh, how that's going. Um, you know, obviously news reports and, and contemporary reports indicate that the, that the inventory of vaccinations is, is not uh, keeping up with demand right now. So we're, we're working with the Snohomish Health District and the state uh, and our transit partners to coordinate and see what we can do to, uh, to help that process along. Our work from home policy uh, currently extends through April 5th. Uh, we continue to evaluate that on a regular basis as we get closer. 
and we've started discussing what a return to base would look like, um, whether that would be something we do in, in phases or in some kind of hybrid model. Um, but that looks like something we will be uh, tackling this spring uh, and scheduling in the summer or fall, uh, depending on how the vaccination process goes. Uh, related to this, we're starting to turn our attention to um, attracting our riders back to the system. Uh, our marketing folks are working on a safety education campaign that they'll be undertaking uh, starting this spring and maintaining through the course of the year in coordination with our transit partners, uh, focused on educating folks out there about what we're doing to provide a safe environment uh, and to assure them that uh, transit remains a safe and, and robust option for them to, to take the trips uh, they need to take. So you'll hear more about that in coming months as we ramp that up, but we're, we're starting to look past uh, the period we've been in here uh, the past several months and, and think about what we need to do to reassure folks that we're still here and that we're providing a service that is both safe and reliable. Uh, as, as folks begin to emerge uh, from, from working from home and, and whatnot. So that's a lot to report on the COVID front. Uh, I wanted to spend a few minutes just giving you a sense of what I've been up to in my first month um, over the last uh, few weeks. Um, I mentioned at the start that I would be looking at about a 90-day onboarding plan that was going to focus about 50% uh, externally and about 50% internally. Uh, with an intensive immersion uh, in company work and, and programs and system and services. Uh, so on the external side, I've been getting out and meeting with stakeholders and legislators and partners. Uh, I wanna thank Mayor Smith. I had an opportunity to participate uh, on week one in the CEO roundtable. Uh, met some of our nonprofit customers uh, who are participating in the Van Gogh program. Uh, I've met with Congressman Larson, uh, Executive Summers. I had a meeting two days ago with uh, Representative Fai, the chair of the House Transportation Committee who's working on new revenue. Uh, and this afternoon met with Debbie Driver of Governor Inslee's staff uh, to talk about the same thing. Next week, we'll be meeting with Senator Hobbs uh, and also Representative Del Bene. Um, in terms of partners, uh, the Mobility Partnership meets regularly, and I've attended two of those meetings uh, with our transit partners, Ferries, FTA, uh, WashDOT. Um, had several WISTA meetings now. Um, had my first SKIT meeting uh, and met with Josh Brown at PSRC, uh, my colleague Kimberly Farley at Sound Transit, Tom Hankson at ET, and so on. Um, I've been welcomed very warmly um, by, by my peers, and it's clear based on the conversations I've had to date that they hold CT in very high regard as a collaborative partner. Um, so it's, it's been fun to, to reintegrate with those folks. Um, I've been out riding the service, uh, rode the green line uh, on week one and the blue line to Everett Station on week two. And then just this week, I uh, got a chance to walk in the customer's shoes. I planned a trip from my house in Ballard to uh, Merrill Creek. And uh, I actually rode my bike from my house to uh, Aurora Village Transit Center and then rode the blue line up here and finished my trip uh, on my bike. So that was kind of fun, except for it was raining and got a little bit wet. But it was great. Got to use the new bike racks and, and it was a real fun experience uh, to, to talk with the operators and and experience the service. Um, I have plans in the works to explore uh, other parts of the transit district. I've talked with some of you about that. I plan to get up north in the next couple of weeks and out to East County uh, to visit some of your cities and, and see some of our longer haul routes. So uh, my goal is at the end of this 90 days to, to have been able to uh, explore uh, all the uh, areas of the county that we're serving and the types of service that we offer. So just internally, I've been meeting with employees, uh, scheduled a series of briefings and tours. Uh, on day one, I visited the operations facility over here at Merrill Creek, the maintenance shop, the dispatch center, 
got an opportunity to, to meet a number of employees, um, toured the Cash Park uh, renovation project and saw the facility uh, maintenance uh, shop over there and the, and the, and the um, uh, van, uh, sorry, rideshare van uh, shop as well. Um, van pools, sorry, I've been talking too long. I got to wrap this up. Um, visited the ride store, met with uh, our colleagues at the IAM, got a scheduled meeting uh, next week with the ATU, which I'm looking forward to. Um, agency priorities and observations. Um, you know, we've got a number of things going on, as you know, and there's some things that are starting to, to emerge uh, in my view that I know I'm going to want to pay some attention to. Uh, you've all been briefed and participated in our efforts to plan for 2024. Uh, and that's going to be a major part of my focus going forward. I had a, a nice briefing with Roland uh, this morning on that. Um, I mentioned to Mayor Smith, uh, we're working with um, the city of Linwood on a pilot project to begin looking at uh, micro transit options for connecting people with transit hubs which could be an innovative uh, way of helping people connect to the transit system, you know, whether it's in the vicinity of a light rail station or somewhere else, or just to help them reduce barriers to entry in the system. So we're excited that, that, that that's got the potential to uh, be an innovative way for us to get more people interested in using our services and the regional connections we're going to be providing. Um, I've also been hearing a lot as I've been out and about about uh, zero emission vehicles uh, and what the potential is for, for CT to consider using them. I know that's something that, that many of you have thoughts on and have been wondering about. We've been in the so-called watchful waiting mode uh, for a while now, and I think we're getting to the point where we, we need to uh, tackle the question. So I'm working with staff to think about how we might do that, and that's a topic that you'll start to see come into the committees uh, in the future. Uh, so we can engage you in that conversation. And then lastly, just sort of a, an interesting, um, an interest of mine is, is performance measurement and, and, and uh, performance management. Uh, the executive team here has done a lot of really interesting and good work on key performance indicators, uh, defining them, um, learning how to use them as management tools uh, to report, monitor, and track agency performance. So we're gonna, we're gonna amp that work up and uh, bring forward uh, to you at some point as part of our planning and, and budget processes, uh, an agency scorecard uh, that will help us uh, reinforce our transparency and our commitment to maintain high levels of performance across all of the different functions that we're providing. So that's a lot. Um, thank you for listening. This is my first board meeting and my first CEO report. Um, I wanna thank you again for, for giving me this opportunity and, and the time you've given me over the past couple of weeks to meet individually and begin to get acquainted. Um, I look forward to, to the months ahead. We've got a lot of exciting work uh, in front of us. So thank you, Mr. Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, that brings us to committee reports. I'll start with the executive committee, which met um, on Thursday, January the 21st. Council members Daughtry, Marine, Wright, and myself attended. CEO report was provided, and uh, the next executive committee meeting is scheduled for the 18th of February at 11.30 a.m. And council member Schwedy on finance performance and oversight. Okay, thank you. Uh, the Finance Performance and Oversight Committee met on Thursday, January the 21st, 2021. Uh, CEO Rick Elgin Fritz, board members Tom Merrill, Sid Roberts, Jared Mead, and I attended. On um, the consent agenda is approval of December 2020 expenditures and payroll items D through H. Uh, reports the December 2020 sales tax report. Uh, this report reflects purchases made in October 2020. In December 2020, Community Transit collected approximately $13.8 in sales tax, which was approximately $1.4 million more than budgeted. Uh, December 2020 diesel fuel report 
Year to date through December 2020, community transit paid an average of $1.43 a gallon for diesel fuel compared to the 2020 budget amount of $2.25 per gallon. Uh, the next Finance Performance and Oversight Committee meeting is scheduled for 2 p.m. Thursday, February the 18th, 2021. Thank you. Appreciate that report. Thank you. And that takes us to Mayor Smith on strategic alignment and capital development. I think you're on mute. Thank you. I was prepared to do that. You wanted to hear the report, actually? And yeah. me <laughs> Got it. So uh, why am I giving this report is because I was asked to chair the meeting last time because um, our dear board member, Stephanie Wright, was not able to attend. So we had a riveting strategic alignment and capital development uh, meeting. Uh, we met remotely via Zoom on Wednesday, January 20th, 2021 at 2 p.m. The meeting was attended by myself, Councilmember Joe Marine, Labor Representative Lance Norton, and Councilmember Jan Sweaty. The committee reviewed and forwarded two items for action at today's Board of Directors meeting. So the first one is a contract in RFP number 03-16 exercise of options for the purchase of eight 60-foot heavy-duty transit buses. So the purchase of eight 60-foot coaches for delivery by contractor New Flyer in 2022 follows the fleet replacement and expansion schedule outlined in the agency's board-adopted transit development plan. Staff will brief the board and answer questions on this purchase later in this meeting today. Second, there's an RFQ number 2017-079, a task order for SWIFT BRT Blue Line expansion design. And this task order provides preliminary and final design plans and specifications by contractor KPFF for the SWIFT Blue Line expansion project. Staff will give a brief presentation to the board and answer questions later in this meeting as well. The committee reviewed and forwarded two items to today's consent agenda. First one being job order number 2018-092-07.A, cash park operating base painting. This project refurbishes the exterior paint of building C, the bus wash building and vault room structure at our cash park base. Work will be performed by contractor Forma. Funds for this project are dedicated in the 2021 board approved budget for an amount not to exceed $229,208. And the second one on the consent agenda is resolution number 03-21. This is an update to authorization of FTA grants. This resolution provides for a change in title of the agency official authorized to approve grant agreements and affirm compliance with disadvantaged business enterprise contracting. The former resolution number uh, 09-91 named the executive director as the agency's official. The title is updated to chief executive officer. No informational items were presented at January's committee meeting and our next regularly scheduled meeting of the Strategic Alignment and Capital Development Committee is Wednesday, February 17th at two. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. That's the end of our committee reports. We do have a number of items on the consent agenda. Does anybody wish to pull any of those for further discussion? If not, we'll open the floor for any potential motion. I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Moved and seconded to approve consent. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I am. You, okay. Mayor Chair. Yeah, go ahead. Mayor John, um, yeah. are we talking about approving everything that's under the uh, consent agenda? Yeah, uh, items A through H under the consent agenda, yes. Yeah, I wanted to uh, speak uh, regarding the uh, award of contract RFP 03 16. Oh, that one's an action item. We'll come to that next, and all that, and you can speak at that point. I'm sorry. Thank you, John. You bet. No problem. 
So do you uh, do you wish? Okay, great. So the consent agenda item items did pass, and um, we'll move into item eight A, and that's uh, RFP three sixteen. And Director Behe will introduce this, and then we'll take comment from the board. Thank you. I um, want to introduce uh, Assistant Manager of Vehicle Maintenance, Todd Burris. Uh, Todd's going to be providing information on the action item for purchase of uh, replacement vehicles. Uh, good after, afternoon, members of the board. Uh, like Wallen said, I am Todd Burris. I'm the Assistant Manager of Programs and Projects for the Maintenance Department. Uh, before you is a memo to request the purchase of eight 60 foot buses. On the memo, we have shown the board approved TDP table. Uh, the six year developmental plan identifies several years of bus replacements. Um, the one I'm here to discuss with you is circled on the table. Uh, the eight buses we'll be replacing are 2007 60 foot buses that are nearing end of life and are scheduled to be removed from service in 2022. They will be 15 years old and have an average of 450,000 miles at the time of their replacement. <clears throat> this request would exercise an option in our contract with New Flyer of America that was established through RFP 03-16. The purchase is included in the slow recovery scenario adopted in the 2020 TDP and 2021 budget. This purchase is locally funded project and will not have federal or state funding. Purchasing vehicles exclusively with local funds is an anomaly. It is normally community transit's practice to utilize FTA formulated funds for replacement and expansion buses when possible. The 2021 adopted budget includes sufficient funds for the purchase of these eight 60 foot buses. So we would request the board of directors authorize the chief executive officer to negotiate and purchase eight 60 foot buses from New Flyer of America under the term. Oh, did you lose me? Sorry about no, that. No, we, we still have you. Oh, my screen went completely blank. And I don't know the last uh, paragraph by heart. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, here it is. Uh, so let me restart that one. Uh, so we would ask for approval that the board of directors authorize the chief executive officer to negotiate and purchase eight 60 foot buses from New Flyer of America under the terms established by contract 03-16 heavy duty transit buses. The purchase will include inspections, contingency, taxes and license fees at the not to exceed amount of $7,788,106. Are there any questions? I have some questions, uh, Todd. This is Lance Norton, a labor representative. Yeah, go ahead, Labor Representative Norton. Thank you, Chair. Um, I am a, a member of the Strategic Alignment and Capital Development Committee, so I was previewed with this uh, and knew it was coming up at this meeting. When the meeting was over I, that evening and a couple of evenings after, I reviewed this, and um, I know uh, that I'm a little disturbed about it, and I'll explain why. Um, we all have the uh, materials that were given, those of us as uh, on the board of directors and the alternates. So I'll briefly go through this, and my questions will appear, and I'll make it as, as quick as I can. In the background, uh, going back to June of 2016, the board awarded the five-year contract to, to New Flyer for our future purchases of 60-foot Arctics. Um, Community Transit awarded then an initial order of 14 of the Arctics, uh, and they were delivered in 2017. Then in May of 18, we ordered 26 Arctics, which were delivered in the summer of 2019. Then in March of 20. 20, that was just um, 16, 15 months ago, we ordered 16 more 60-foot uh, Arctics that will be delivered the second quarter of 2021, which is within the next four months. That's a total of 56 Arctics in the four years. 
The uh, fleet replacement and expansion schedule in the current transit development plan, as I read it, establishes a requirement. If there is such a requirement, and I wrote this before I got to the end, I would assume this was under normal conditions, such as ridership, mileage, etc. Again, the transit development plan establishes a requirement that eight 60-foot bus replacements be ordered in 2021, except under the year of order chart, it states, and that's the bus fleet replacement there. There's uh, two sentences there. This request is to exercise an option in the contract for the purchase of eight new Flyer 60 foot buses if ordered in February 2021. That's now. All, all was assumed, all of this was assumed under normal conditions. And I understand, you know, um, in one of the previous reports today, uh, Jerry had said that the current uh, operating for community transit is 170 million, of which I guess about 15 million we're on our own for. But spending $8 million for another eight RTICs when it's not mandatory in this contract or anything like that, I, I just don't understand how important that is. And I know I'm going to hear about the life expectancy of these buses and how many years and otherwise they all just simply sit somewhere and fall apart, which isn't true. I understand also that some of the drivers are not going to be real happy with me but I drove for 36 years, and I know how exciting and how nice it was to get new buses. However, for us to spend $8 million under the present conditions that we're suffering through, with the ridership down uh, 58%, with, with uh, van pools being stored, we're looking for property to store them, I, I don't see, and I respect the, the expertise that we have in our vehicle department, uh, our vehicle maintenance department. Uh, it's a terrific group, all of the people there. Uh, but I don't see spending $8 million when it's not absolutely necessary under these conditions. Thank you for the time. Thank you. And does, it, does anybody from staff uh, have some comments on that? Uh, since Roland uh, introduced the item, uh, I can, I'll, I'll ask Roland if he'd like to, to speak to the, to the issues. Sure, sure. Um, on the question, uh, so I, I think I heard a couple of questions in, um, in Labor Re Representative Norton's remarks, and I'll just address them as I, um, as I wrote them down. Uh, the question of, our, um, of the fleet expansion that is called for and the replacement cycles, uh, we have a, adopted a transit asset management plan to maintain state of good repair in our fleet. Uh, we have established the 15 year life expectancy um, for the vehicles. And that is why this purchase is coming forward at this point. This is not an expansion of fleet, but a replacement of fleet. And it is per our um, long established state of good repair policy as an agency. Um, and that plan that we have um, provided to, uh, to FTA and that has been approved for that, uh, for that asset management plan. Um, the second issue, just in terms of the, um, the level of service we're offering and the, the ridership, uh, I will say that these are, uh, the, the level of fleet that these are replacing um, are very important for us right now, particularly from the perspective that they are Arctic's. And under the current um, level of use of our system, we have um, what we've seen is we are utilizing the Arctic platform more than we ever have in our history in terms of trying to ensure adequate social distancing on the line. So we've even started to use articulated coaches to a much greater extent on local routes than we have uh, in previous years to try and um, maintain that space. And this is part of trying to make sure that we continue to have that capacity mm -hmm. moving forward. I would also offer that earlier um, in 2020, uh, we actually did downsize uh, purchasing activity that had been called for in the TDP when we understood that demand would be uh, falling off. And so uh, you may recall that in the, the purchase that we brought forward um, mid-year in 2020, we actually uh, 
eliminated the uh, previously planned expansion and also um, reduced the level of replacement uh, in the order that was made in 2020 for delivery this year in 2021. Thank you, Director Behe. Um, any other questions or comments or concerns from board members? Okay. Uh, there is a recommended motion. I'll open the floor for if anybody cares to make a motion or if there's any further questions. I guess, Chair Nering? Yes. Could I ask staff, what are the consequences of not passing this? Uh, if we do not, so again, Roland Behe, um, Director of Planning and Development. Uh, the, the buses that these are replacing are, as, um, as Todd Burris shared in the presentation, um, are nearing end of life. And so it, um, it would uh, put at risk our capability to maintain the fleet in state of good repair in order to support the current level of service. And I will say, um, uh, I just wanna um, emphasize that we are, we are hearing a level of concern right now from our maintenance staff on the high utilization rate for articulated buses under current conditions, and so we do have a we do have a level of concern around maintaining um, the um, the numbers and also the quality of the vehicles, particularly in that Arctic fleet at the current time. Oh my God! Uh, this is Rick. I would add to to Roland's uh, response to that last question. Um, in his initial response, he referenced uh, state of good repair and uh, the plan that we've, the asset management plan we've submitted and had approved by FTA. So we are an FTA grantee and we are relying on our federal funding partnership to support the delivery and the expansion of our services, uh, particularly uh, with the upcoming investment in the orange line. And, and the state of good repair policy and, and, the, and the asset management plan are requirements of, of federal grantees. So they've, they've approved this plan and our capital replacement schedule and we've budgeted for it. Uh, it's important, you know, from the standpoint of our federal funding partnership to, to implement that plan. Mr. Chair, if I could respond to that. Yes, go ahead and then, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Rick, I, I understand what you just said. Um, the only problem I have is that we've used all of the funding up. There is no funding for this $8 million purchase. And um, I honestly understand life expectancy of these vehicles. Under these conditions, the 56 buses, our ticks, brand new that we purchased in the past four years, isn't enough. I, I just find that extremely unusual, but I, I'm not prepared to continue arguing. You guys have me outmanned and, you know, being from the East Coast like I was years ago, I, I can submit to that. So anyhow, thank you for allowing me to express my, uh, my concerns. Certainly, thank you. Mayor Marine, or uh, Council Member Marine. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Chair Neary. Um so I was, first of all, curious as to, uh, and it was sort of alluded to in the last uh, conversation, but where is the money coming from? I was assuming most of it was in the federal grant funding, but is that not the case? I can speak to that. Um, again, Roland Behe, Director of Planning and Development. Um, the, the purchase is fully funded in, uh, in both the transit development plan and in the adopted uh, budget. Uh, the, the, the unusual aspect to it is that it is funded with 100% local funding and not a mix of federal formula funding or state grant funding and local funding. Our normal practice is to purchase buses with a, um, with a high fraction of grant funding and then match that with local funds. We, um, every, every few years, we have to make a purchase like this that is... Um, more heavily weighted toward local funds in order to balance the federal funding in our long-term plan. Uh, with the cost of vehicles and the number that we need to replace, there isn't enough federal funding to, um, to provide grant, grant funding in every purchase. 
And there's also um, some strategic value in focusing the grant funding purchase in the purchases um, where you um, where you can do that. And then with a completely locally funded purchase that actually streamlines the purchasing process. So this is part of a normally expected strategy um, in that six year uh, vehicle purchase plan. And so regardless of the fact that there isn't any federal funding with this particular purchase, it still would fall under the regulations that we are required uh, to keep a fleet to a certain level with regard to the federal funding we do receive. It, you are correct in terms of our asset management plan applies to our entire fleet. Okay, regardless of whether it was federal funding. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Council Member Roberts. Yeah, so Roland, this question for Roland. So is the uh, the average mileage on, on these buses about 450,000, is, is that correct? I mean, are, are these pretty much at end of life? And second question, aren't these kind of the workhorses of the agency really when it comes down to it? I realize that 40 footers do a lot, a lot of work. Um, could you answer those two questions for me? Well, I think I could answer that question. I, I did uh, check the mileage and when these are replaced, Next year, they will be over the 450,000 mile mark. And they are uh, the 60 foot since COVID has started has been our workhorse. They, they've been out there working a lot, running on 40 foot routes and they are a lot of mileage. One other point that I would add to what, to what Todd said is um, the, the federal replacement standard for vehicles uh, is a 12 year standard in our asset management plan. We actually, um, our, our standard is 15 years at community transit um, because we do have a high standard of maintenance for those vehicles. And so we've actually, the, the vehicles will be replaced at 15 years, which is three years longer than the federal minimum, um, but is in accordance with our asset management plan. Uh, hey, Roland, um, was that, I remember during the, the great recession back when I first came on the board in 2010, we extended that uh, expectation to write, to help write out that recession. Was that when we went from 12 to 15 years or did we go beyond 15 years during that and then ratchet it back to 15? We had, uh, you're, you're correct in your recollection, Mayor Nearing, um, the prior to the great recession, the standard was 14 years. During the great recession, we extended to 16 years and then following the Great Recession, we um, we went back to 15 years. We felt that our experience with maintenance was successful enough that we could um, ratchet it back one year at that point, but we didn't have to go all the way back to a 14 year replacement cycle. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh. Oh God. Anybody else have? Yeah, uh, Councilmember Marine, did you have another question? You're on mute, I think. Yeah, I, I don't have a question. I was going to make a motion if you're ready. Yes, go ahead. I would move that the uh, board authorize the chief executive officer, officer to negotiate and purchase eight 60 foot buses from New Flyer of America Incorporated under the terms established by contract 103 16 heavy duty transit buses. The purchase will include inspections, contingency taxes, and license fees at the not to exceed amount of $7,788,106. Second. We have a motion uh, by Councilmember Marine, a second by Councilmember Schwecki, and we'll open the floor for any final discussion before I call for the vote. Anybody have anything final they want to say? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. The motion passes. Thank you, and that takes us to award uh, of RFQ 2017-079. This is the Swift BRT Blue Line Expansion Design. And I believe that goes to director, well, who does that go to? I'll, I'll, I'll kick it to our CEO to make sure. I can introduce it. Okay, go ahead. 
yeah, this is again, Roland Behe, Director of Planning and Development. So yeah, I just, I wanna introduce uh, Melissa Colley, who is our Manager of Regional Programs and Projects. Um, and just as by way of introduction, I wanna um, recall uh, the board in your workshop in October of last year, uh, had a presentation from Melissa on the, um, the vision for the future SWIFT BRT network. Uh, and you may recall that um, presentation uh, talking about the long-term vision for build out and uh, full integration with link and connection of centers with um, throughout Snohomish County. So we are really excited to be moving forward on um, the next element of building that vision out. And so Melissa is going um, to describe that next step. Good afternoon, everyone from rainy Lake Stevens. I blame council member Daughtry for all the rain today. So if he could work <laughs> on that, that would be great. Uh, it's good to see all of you. So you have before you today awarding uh, the RFQ 2017-079, which is uh, design and engineering of the Swift Blue Line expansion project. And the committee members thought it would be good to just do a refresh with our board on this project. It's been a little while since we've talked about it. So uh, next slide, Rachel. Before we get into the project details, I think you heard our CEO talk a little bit about uh, our SWIFT performance uh, during the pandemic. And one of the things that's been really heartening for us is to see how well utilized our SWIFT service has been and even in the midst of a pandemic. So SWIFT Blue Line boardings remain strong. In 2020, we had about 1.5 million uh, boardings. And currently right now, our SWIFT service is accounting for about 42% of our total fixed route service. So what is really meaningful to us is that people are utilizing it. And we know that people are utilizing it for some really essential trips right now. And so we feel really um, grateful that they have these crucial connections to make. So let's talk a little bit uh, about uh, the SWIFT project, the Blue Line project. If you'll, next slide. So just a reminder that uh, we currently have our SWIFT Blue Line that's been up and running since 2009. So this is an expansion of the current line, 1.7 miles past the current term terminus at Aurora Transit Center. Very excited that we will extend to serve the Sound Transit Link Light Rail Station at 185th Street and Shoreline. And also you'll remember in October, we talked about the network effects. So uh, the ability to connect to the SWIFT green line and the SWIFT orange line. And we are phasing this project into two phases. So phase one, which is starting in 2021 is uh, includes the purchase of four expansion buses. Uh, we're gonna construct two SWIFT stations at that Sam Transit Link Light Rail Station and Shoreline. And then what we're asking for today is approval to begin design and engineering of speed and reliability improvements uh, for the corridor, primarily outside of the city of Everett. And then phase two will begin uh, sometime in 2024, and we'll go back and look at additional speed and reliability improvements, primarily within the city of Everett. Next slide. So some project status for everyone. Uh, we completed our scoping uh, report in 2020. Uh, that uh, gave us some really good information about the preferred alignment so that we are going to continue to serve Aurora Transit Center and then routing along uh, Meridian Avenue North and then to that 185th Street Station. It also gave us uh, some alternatives for speed and reliability. So things like creation of bat lanes and implementation of TSP along the route where there are some gaps. We uh, were awarded in PSRC's regional competition last year, $3.2 million in CMAP funding that will help us with the purchase of the expansion buses. And right now, pending uh, approval from our state legislature, we've been recommended for $3.7 million from the Regional Mobility Program. What's great about this uh, award of funding is it will fund the construction phase of what we're asking for you to award today on the design and engineering phase. So we'll already have those, that money uh, in hand to begin the construction phase for those phase one speed and reliability improvements. Uh, we have sufficient uh, funds budgeted that in the fiscal year 21 budget that you approved last December to award this contract. And so our next steps are just to receive approval from the board today to award the design and engineering contract to KPFF. And then we will kick off this next phase uh, in mid-February. Mid next slide. 
This is just our overall project schedule for uh, phase one. So you can see we're in quarter one right now of 2021, and that will take us the design and environmental and engineering phase will take us into mid 2022 and then beginning construction in uh, third quarter of 2022 uh, to early 2024. The great thing about uh, this phase one speed and reliability improvements is if we can get it done earlier, uh, prior to the 185th Street Link Light Rail Station going into service, our current SWIFT line will be able to take advantage of those speed and reliability improvements. And then, uh, Subsequent to that, we'll go back a little bit closer to when revenue service is going to start at that station and put our SWIFT stations in there. So Sand Transit will be building the platform and then we'll go in and construct the, the stations and put them in there to begin revenue service when that uh, link light rail station uh, from Sound Transit is up and ready to begin. So that's just a real brief overview of the project um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Anybody have questions on this? All right. Um, and so there's uh, a recommended motion that you see right there. We'll open the floor to see if anybody cares to make that motion. Yes, Councilmember Marine. Okay, I was going to let it go a little bit. I'll go ahead. Uh, I remove uh, the, or I recommend that the board authorize the chief executive officer to negotiate and award a task order number RFQ number 2017-079 to KPFF Consulting Engineers Incorporated for a not to exceed amount of $397,768 for the 100% design of the Swift BRT Blue Line Expansion Project. Second. Okay. <laughs> Moved and seconded. Any final discussion? Um, uh, Chair, I would just like to say uh, so glad to be back and part of it as we continue to expand. Um, I remember when we first started the Swift line and and how exciting that was and where we've come and you know continue on into the future and glad to see that it's had the success as it has and uh, everything is working as it's supposed to, how, how it was designed. Thank you. I'd also like to comment that I think this shows community transit's um, uh, gumption to hook up to the light rail system and make sure that we're going to be able to connect all of our citizens to light rail in the future. And this will be basically our first one, I believe, that we're really going to be uh, showcasing here, besides the one when we start pulling back out of the downtown Seattle up, up towards the uh, I guess that'd be Northgate, but uh, this is one where I think that it's really important to show what we're really trying to accomplish at CT and, and getting um, people moving on to the, uh, the newest line in the, in the west of uh, light rail. So I think this is a really important step. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and the chair's report, that brings us to the end of the business portion of the agenda. So the chair's report, at last month's meeting, uh, the board did approve, as you'll recall, providing ORCA cards to board members and alternates. And Rachel has been working to get those ORCA cards in motion and will be reaching out following the board meeting to coordinate that. The next regularly scheduled meeting is March the 4th at 3 p.m. And uh, we will proceed with the election of officers after board communication. So why don't we go through everybody? I'll start with uh, Council Member Daughtry. I have really nothing to report other than the fact that, yeah, it might be raining, but we finally taken care of some of the problems with the lake and the flooding in downtown Lake Stevens. So that's uh, really kind of important um, work. Um, Looking forward to some conversations with the staff on one of my proposals for the Arlington area and Lake Stevens Arlington and uh, looking forward to uh, the year and how everything is going. This is this is an exciting times, even though we've been put behind uh, due to COVID. Uh, I think we've came through this uh, relatively unscathed other than lo loss of revenue or loss of ridership, but I think we're looking good and I'm really excited to be a part of it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Councilmember Marine. 
Uh, I have nothing at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Mead. No, nope, thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Merrill. I have nothing at this time. Appreciate it. And uh, Labor Representative Norton. But nothing, thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Roberts. Um, yes, yeah, just that it's all good in Stanwood. Um, we are really growing. And uh, there were years uh, when I first moved to the area that nothing happened up here. And now it's like a war zone. Um, it's wet. There's a lot of construction going on. There's a couple hundred new homes in, in the pipeline. We've, we've just uh, had about uh, two, 300 built. And there are still isn't enough uh, housing up here. So we're growing. Glad to be a part of uh, community transit and hooking up uh, uh, commuters that uh, can get to their jobs. And it's, it's all good. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Schwede. Yes, I have a couple of things. Um, if you've read the papers lately, a lot is happening in Arlington. Uh, besides Amazon and the manufacturing of electric airplanes, you can drive down 531 and see the enormous manufacturing buildings being built right now. Uh, the Amazon space program building is so big, you have to stop on the road and look down to see how long it is. Uh, yesterday, when I drove by, the line of cars went the full length of the building. So whatever they're doing in there, it's up and running. Uh, my favorite is the Coca-Cola building. It is really attractive uh, right across from <clears throat> the airport uh, office and they bought the last piece of property that Paul Allen owned in Arlington. Uh, if you know anyone looking for a job, send them to Arlington. There is a for hire sign on every corner. Uh, for those that didn't see Josh Brown at the SCT General Assembly, he did talk about the aviation study and said that the traffic study they had done indicated that South Sound was the best option for the second SeaTac. I just know that it won't be in Arlington. Uh, although we are experiencing a lot more corporate jets coming in about now. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. Mayor Smith. Thank you. So to, um, so um, Mayor Nuring, can we, can I just talk a little bit about our meeting this morning and sort of the community yes. transit ask? Yeah. So following up on the um, Arlington uh, vaccination site and how uh, successful that is, um, Mayor Tolbert actually uh, brought up at our North and South Mayor's meeting. We meet uh, every other month, I think, or monthly. And she said one of the biggest issues, especially up North, is getting people to the vaccination site. And so uh, for her example was, can we get a community transit COVID bus to take people directly from Darrington to the Arlington vaccination site? And are there other routes that community transit could think about uh, just putting COVID buses online uh, to get people to vaccinations? Um, so uh, I thought that was an interesting idea. We promised that we would bring that to your attention today. And at some point, uh, if you want to noodle that and talk about it, uh, Mary Nuring and I can certainly report back to the mayors. It might go better if you don't call it a COVID bus, though. Just say <laughs> shot bus. Uh, Mayor Smith, to that's, whoever names it. <laughs> that is definitely something we can um, put our heads together on and, and have some discussion about and, and follow up with you. Um, and I, I remember our first conversation a couple weeks back about interest in community partners and players coming to the table to, to see how they could help with this. And so it seems like it's this idea is in that spirit. So we'll 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 put our heads together and follow up. Thank you for bringing that up, Mayor Smith. And Council Member Wright. I didn't have any report, but since I'm right behind Nicola, I'm going to take the advantage and say, um, how about the DART program? Uh, maybe some of those vehicles might be ideal for those, especially around specific shot appointments. Um, but I really like that idea of connecting people, especially for our population, that it's harder to that harder to drive or get connected for appointments. And this should be just like any other medical appointment, I would think. 
So um, thank you. And yeah. thanks, Rick, for being so responsive to that suggestion. Great point. Thank you. All right. Um, that brings us to the annual uh, event at the end of the February board meeting where we elect our officers for the next board year. And uh, let me get to a few of the notes on that. So board officers, as you know, are elected February board meeting of each year. The positions elected include the leadership positions on the board. That's board chair, vice chair, and secretary for a one-year term. Nominations will be taken from the board for each officer position. Any voting member of the board is eligible for a position um, and they'll be elected in this order. First the chair, then the vice chair, and then the secretary. Any board member can nominate and board members may also self-nominate. The officers may, if re-elected, serve consecutive terms. Voting members may vote or they may abstain. The person with the majority of votes will take the position and with that, why don't we open the floor up to start with for nominations for the chair position? You can raise your hand or just raise your physical hand or raise your virtual hand, whatever's easiest for you. Yes, go ahead, Councilmember Wright. I would like to nominate uh, Kim Daughtry. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Is there any other nominations? Okay. Councilmember Daughtry, did you want to say anything? You don't need to, but uh, the script calls for the opportunity to do so. Uh, no, but I, I really ex I really appreciate the nomination, Stephanie. Thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to uh, trying to do my best as the chair, uh, trying to take over for some of the people that have been before me is going to be very difficult. Um, Mayor Erling, Mayor Nering, Joe Marine, uh, several others. I mean, I wasn't on the board when Stephanie was there, but uh, I took that two year hiatus, but I kind of wish I had been there. Uh, but thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to uh, being the chair. Thank you. All right, we'll go ahead then. Uh, all in favor of uh, Councilmember Daughtry as chair. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? It's unanimous. Congratulations, Councilmember Daughtry. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Um, the vice chair position. Open the floor for any nominations. Councilmember Schweit. Yes, I'd like to nominate uh, Joe Marine. Thank you. Second. Any other nominations? Okay. And Councilmember Marine, would you like to say anything? I'll just be uh, brief, say I'm, again, glad to be back, uh, super excited to be part of Community Transit again and, and uh, working with all of you. Thank you. All those in favor then uh, for Councilmember Marine as Vice Chair. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? It's unanimous. Congratulations and thank you, Councilmember Marine. Thank you. And that opens the floor up for the secretary position. Council member Wright. I'd like to nominate Jan Schwetty. Second. Thank you. Any other nominations? Okay. Council member Schwetty, would you like to say anything? Oh, you guys know how I feel about community transit. It is absolutely the best group of people that I have ever worked for in my entire life. And I enjoy being involved and going to meetings at Community Transit more than I do anyplace else. So I appreciate it, Stephanie. Thank you for that. And with that, we'll uh, call for all those in favor of Council Member Schwedy as secretary. Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Congratulations, Councilmember Schwedy. Thank you. That rounds out our uh, new team of officers for this coming year. And uh, as one final note, uh, Rachel will contact you following this meeting and collect any committee assignment, change the request and work with the board chair then to finalize committee assignments in time for the February committee meeting. So you can expect that and think through if you'd like to request any changes and then uh, Chair Daughtry can work on work through that. 
And with that, I don't believe we have need of an executive session. Is that accurate? No. Yeah. No. That is, that is the case. Okay, good, good. Perfect. Well, we are then uh, in the position to let you out and you still got some time left in your day. Mr. Chair, you. if I may. Yes, sir. If I, just one final word, if I could uh, congratulate the new officers. Um, I'm looking forward to working with you. Um, and uh, I know we'll uh, continue to benefit uh, Mayor Nairing from your council as well on the executive committee. So I, I appreciated uh, incoming Chair Daughtry's comments about it being a big an exciting year and uh, I share that optimism and, and enthusiasm and I, I'm looking forward to getting to work with uh, the new leadership team. So congrats and thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Yes, congrats to all. It's a great team you've got there, Rick. It's good to see Councilmember Schwede get uh, in here. She's served a long time, so thank you. All right, everybody. Well, enjoy the rest of the rainy afternoon. We'll see you at committee meetings or the next board meeting or sometime in between. Take care. Meeting adjourned.